His promise still stands. You know, I was thinking that, and I was thinking, what are some promises that you've given me, God? And one of the promises the Lord gave me was, um, all your children should be taught. It, it says, all your children should be taught by the Lord, and grace shall be their peace. And another promise he gave me in Isaiah 33, 3, it says, behold, you shall see great and mighty things that you know not of. And if you call upon me, you'll see the great and mighty things that you know not of. And, and um, I'm believing him for a miracle with one of my kids. And, um, you know, I, I'm going to just get really real with you guys because, you know, that's what I do anyways. But um, I'm not a super sensitive type person like where, you know, I hear moms and they're like, my prodigals and their hearts are just breaking over the kids. Oh, they're not walking with the Lord. and They're just dying because of that. You know, I'm not that way. I, and I always get so kind of like. Oh, I feel so bad. I'm not like that. You know, I'm just kind of like, whatever. My kids make their own choices. They live their life. They got to deal with the consequences of it, you know. But um, but when you watch one of your kids suffer because of those consequences, because of those choices, and they're asking you to help and you can't step in, that's a little bit different. And I, and, 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 um, and so, you know, tonight I just was faced with the same situation that we've been talking about, I think, for the last couple years with all of us. All of us have been going through it is move out the way and let God be God by himself. And then that may mean that one of my kids has to suffer tremendously till he gets it, you know. And, and it's so easy to say that, but it's so hard to do. It's, it's, it's really difficult to do. And it's a trip how the Lord just constantly keeps bringing it back, keeps bringing it back, bringing it back, bringing that back to me. But I can tell you guys something today. I can tell you this. It don't matter what I feel. God is God. He is faithful to himself. You gave me a promise. All my children should be kept of the Lord and grace shall be their peace. You promised that. So I don't have to put my hands on it. I just have to believe your promises. And he'll do it. And he'll get it. And if he don't get it, then he'll get it on the other side of heaven. And I'm, I'm at a place where it's just like, Lord, I don't have a need to fix or save or rescue anybody. Only you can do that. As painful as it is, as much as he's cussing me out and telling me how much of a horrible mama I am because I won't help him. And it's the trip how the enemy knows that that's one of our, you know, one of those buttons. So tonight I did come in a little bit heavy because I was kind of struggling with what do I do? But I was just reminded in worship, I don't do nothing. I let God be God by himself and do what he's going to do. Because whatever it is, I will tell you it was all that pain is what drew, drew me to Jesus. That's what drew me to Jesus. Get my butt kicked by the world and realizing there is nothing here. And I need help. And one of the other things, ladies, that I also recognize is people don't really want to change. They want their circumstances to change. They want to be comfortable. They want their circumstances to change. But they don't want to change. So, I'm going to let God be God, but you guys can pray for my baby. That the Lord will bring him to himself. Okay, we are in Acts 8. And um, we are going to be going into, we finished up with Stephen, the first martyr. Of the first martyr of the church. And um, so the last time that we were together, and I'm so sorry, it's been a while. <laughs> uh, the last time we saw that Stephen was the first martyr of the church. Hold on, guys. I got Daryl always tells me to turn on this thing. I always forget. I don't even know what you're supposed to do with that. Oh, I guess here. Okay. Um, we saw that Stephen was the first martyr of the church. And that this was going to be the beginning of the catalyst of the church. It was like a tipping, a turning point. Because up to then, remember, we, you know, we had watched how 
the disciples had waited in the upper room that were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, that were moving in the Spirit. Everything was happening. People were getting saved by the thousands, right? The church just blew up literally like overnight, right? And then, then they had some difficulties because the church blew up overnight and all these people who had came from other um, places outside of Jerusalem had to come to Jerusalem so that they could um, come worship and do all of that because it was the feast. Of the, it was during the feast that um, the Holy Spirit, the day of Pentecost happened. And so what happened was a whole lot of people did not go back to the countries that they came from. And so they were all there and the widows needed to be taken care of. And do you remember that there was like a division between the Jews and the, and, and the um, uh, I want to say the Samaritans, but the, 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 um, the non-Jews, <laughs> I can't think right now, but uh you know, and then so the being very filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter and, and the apostles decided to appoint, had them people appoint seven Holy Spirit filled men, which is what I pray for our church, seven Holy Spirit filled men um, that with wisdom and that they would take care of uh, the widows. And so they did all of that. We found that Stephen was also a part of, um, he came from the same place. Hold on, you guys. I'm so sorry. My brain is everywhere. You know how my. My mind's be all over the place. Lord, we ask for just clarity of mind. And I ask, Lord, God, you slow my mind down. <laughs> so what happened was then, of course, we saw that Stephen was brought before the Sanhedrin um, and the elite Jews. And Paul, who, well, Saul, who will become Paul, was there. He was actually one of the charging members to decide if Stephen would be stoned or not. And um, as he lays out the gospel and the history to the Jews, he kind of catches them in an aha moment. Because as he's giving them all of this information, like, this is our history. This is our history. This is, And they're like, yeah, that's right. That's true. That's right. That's good. That's us. That's this. And then he gets to the end and he charges them with, but you killed the prophets and you killed Jesus. Right. And they're just like, it says they're cut to the heart. But remember that we noticed that in chapter one, I mean, in chapter two, when the people were cut to the heart, they came and they said, what can I do to be saved? In chapter three, when they were cut to the heart, they plotted to kill. Remember? And they arrested, um, they arrested Peter in them. And then, it's, and now we see in chapter, in chapter seven it, with, uh, with, with uh, Stephen, it says they were cut to the heart. And it caused violence. It caused a horrible, violent reaction to the point that it was so angry and so violent that they gnashed their teeth and rushed at him and stoned him. Have you ever been so mad at somebody you want to bite them? Yeah. <laughs> right. So for picking up and, <clears throat> and then, of course, we see that Stephen filled of the Holy Spirit. And one of the things, this is probably one of the most, I think this is one of the most amazing stories in the Bible because he, um, because not only does he see the Lord as he's being stoned, but it says that Jesus is standing. You never see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father in the Bible. You always say he sits. He's always sitting at the right hand, right? And I, and I love this part where it says, but he being filled of the Holy Spirit gazed into heaven and saw the glory of the Lord and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. His sacrifice of laying down his life, the first time, the first time you see it in the gospel, his sacrifice to lay down his life caused our Jesus to stand up and go, look at my baby, come on up here. You know, and I just always, I always vision that. Like Jesus was so like, so proud of that moment. And then they stole Stephen and he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And look what it says. And when he said this, he fell asleep. The same words that Jesus uttered on the cross when he died. Lord, forgive them not, for they know not what they do. It's amazing to me that when we're full of the Holy Spirit, when our, when our spirit is full of the Holy Spirit, we cannot hold hatred. We cannot hold unforgiveness. Those two do not reside together. Bitterness and the Holy Spirit do not reside in the same, it, it, together. They can't be in the same place. 
And so we see all these people as, as, they, as they're losing their life for the gospel, for the love of Christ. It compels them. And they're losing their life for the gospel. What do they pour out? What pours out through the Spirit? Forgiveness and love. Lord, forgive them for they're not, not what they do. I don't have that attitude today with the politics. I am finding myself really angry. I am finding myself ugly and saying really ugly things. And I'm like, Lord, what, what are you, why, what is going on here? And then the other day, I kind of like had an argument with God. Like, you really are just going to allow this to happen? Like, all these people are going to suffer because these people want to be in power? Like, well, how, how does that work? And then, of course, God has to remind me he's God by himself. <laughs> and he's sovereign. And I, my heart should not be angry and it should not be evil towards people. And I should not be talking about Democrats. And I should not be none of those things. Because my heart should be broken over the sinfulness of man. And so I was kind of convicted with that. What pours out? Is it forgiveness? Is it, is it bitterness? Is it anger? Or do I want them to get their teeth broken in their mouth, like David says, to break their teeth in their mouth? And I pray that sometimes. So, so starting in chapter 8, verse 1. Now Saul was consenting to his death. At, at that time, <clears throat> a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. So at this point, there is a catalyst that happens within the church. Okay, this brand baby new church. There's a catalyst, a tipping point that happens. And it amazed me as I was looking at it, it says, now, if you start off, it says, now Saul was consenting to his death and a great persecution arose. You know, it's always something that the Lord will use to move us out of our complacency. See, Jesus gave them, a, he gave us a commission. Go into the world and share the gospel. They were comfortable in Jerusalem. They were sitting in their church. Their church was growing and it was active and it was moving and things were happening. This is where God wants us to be. This is what God is doing. Do you see how much God is blessing this? So we don't, we don't, we don't, I mean, you know, it's good. People are coming to the church. That's, that's what we want people to come to the church. That's not what Jesus said. The commission says go into the world. And if God had left it up to the men, because if he left it up to us, we would stay comfortable. We would not move out of our comfort zones. So it says, it, it, it amazes me, God will use anything to move us out of complacency in our comfort zones. And many times, you guys, it could be a threat of loss. It's something that is extremely uncomfortable. It also could be persecution from others. What we're going to see this week is the sovereignty of God and how he's always moving all the pieces of the puzzle to complete his purpose for his glory. See, I sometimes, and, and I'll use me, I sometimes, I forget it's his purpose, his glory. So I get comfortable here, or I get stuck in this thing, or I want this thing, and I'm complacent at this moment. And God goes, Kim, I had something over here. I have a person for you to meet. I have an opportunity for you to share. I have a sister that is captive that she needs to be set free, and you're the only one that I want to use to do that. And if I don't open myself up to go, whatever you need, Lord, and I get stuck in Kim's little rut, which Kim can get stuck in her little rut. Y'all know that. I can get stuck. And I'm just like, I ain't doing nothing. Right here. This is good. I'm fine. And the Lord goes, uh-uh. Something super uncomfortable. Something's way out my, something smacking me upside the head to move me out of my complacency. So it's not always is it a chastisement. It's not that it's a chastisement. Sometimes we look at things and we think, well, this is happening because of sin. It doesn't always have to be because of sin. It has to be because our God is alive. And he's always moving. He's always working. 
He always has something for his glory and his purpose in your life. But if you're still staying in a rut, not moving, he will do something to move you out of it. Because it's not about us. And so what we're going to see this week is the sovereignty of God and how he's always moving all the pieces of the puzzle to accomplish his purpose in his children's life. And we're also going to see the mission of the church as a whole, right? It says Saul was consenting to Stephen's death. We're introduced to a young scholar, the Saul of Tarsus. That's what he was. And, and we know that Saul, um, we know Saul becomes the apostle Paul in chapter nine, but Saul of Tarsus was a, a formidable dude. Like, I mean, he was extremely intelligent. He had a dual citizenship. He was the Hebrew of the Hebrews, but he also had uh, a citizenship like Roman citizenship, right? He was raised up under the, the uh, 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 Gamaliel, who we learned earlier was one of the most respected Pharisees in all of the Sanhedrins and all of the elite, you know, uh, religious. He was extremely smart. If you look at just the way uh, Paul writes and in the, the depth of what he writes, he is intelligent. He can speak. He can he can philosophize with the best of them. Right. He kind of reminds me. I know this is so horrible, but it reminds me of Daryl. <laughs> like he can contend just on every level in any conversation with anybody about anything. That was one of the things that totally attracted me to Daryl in the first place. It was like that boy could talk. Um <laughs> His brain was just unmatched. Um, but anyway, so we learned that he was there and he was watching everything and he was listening when Stephen was given this whole rendition of the Jews' history. And he was like, yeah. But his later on, I think it's in Hebrews where he says he was so zealous, but he was zealous for the wrong thing. And you know, ladies, we can be so sincere about something. Have you ever been so sincere about something like this is just absolutely my, I will lay my life down for this and be sincerely wrong? That's where he was at. <clears throat> Most scholars believe that Saul voted and consented to have Stephen stoned. Later, after the Damascus road, when Saul is transformed to the Apostle Paul, we will see his motives and motivation before Christ. In Philippians 3, verse 4, it says, though this is Paul talking. Though I myself could have such confidence, if anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of the Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as a law, as onto a Pharisee. He said, I die every credential possible. Every, and I can have all my confidence in these credentials and in the flesh. But he says, I count it all as nothing. He was devout and zealous for the wrong reasons. He thought he was doing the will of the Lord. What we will see is how both a devout, the dev devout religious man and a magician can both think that they're doing the will of the Lord. Deception comes in so many forms, ladies. In both cases with Saul and Simon, we're going to see how the schemes, devices, and strategy of the enemy always has a counterfeit to what God is doing. See, the enemy, he likes for us to be religious. He doesn't have a problem with, with us being religious. N none whatsoever. Yeah, go, go knock on some doors. Yeah, go, you know, yeah, go do this for the Lord. Go ahead. Blow yourself up. <laughs> Whatever it may be. You know, and I'm not talking about something to that extreme. I'm talking about just going to church, just being religious. He does not have a problem with that. There is no threat to the kingdom of the enemy when you're just religious. Because really, it's a distraction from the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit and the relationship with Christ. That's what his problem is. So anything he can give us to keep us away from God, the truth, yielded in the spirit to Jesus, anything he can give us, he will. A lot of times what you see in the church, and it was really sad, is you see a whole bunch of Christians that some people are just on fire and they're just walking with the Lord and they're just doing so good. And then they get this amazing job. And the first thing goes, church. You see them drawing really close to God and the enemy comes along and says, hey, but what about this over here? You know, the Lord is blessing you. He wants you to have this. 
And we don't have the discernment to say, okay, is that going to draw me closer to you, Lord? Or is that going to take me further away from you? And so we just, oh, money, let's go. I'm still going to go to church. And then all of a sudden it just starts, church just starts going to the wayside because he will give you whatever you want so that he can keep you from the relationship with Christ. And if you do belong to Christ, he will do everything possible to keep you ineffective. Once Saul consented to the death of Stephen, he was stirred into a frizzy. Look at it. It says, Saul was consenting to his death. The persecution read, the devout man carried Stephen to his burial. But then it says, as for Saul, he began to make havoc on the church. Before that, he was just there. He was watching. He was observing. But in verse 3, he began to, to create havoc on the church. Resistance to the Holy Spirit brings violence. Resistance to, and I mean, I don't know if you guys have experienced that, but I have seen that over and over in my own life and in other people's lives. When the Holy Spirit begins to deal with a person, they react in one or two ways. They either yield or they go nuts. Have you seen that? And a lot of times that nuts becomes really violent as an out, as a, an outrage against you because they can't hit God, but they can hit you. And you're like, what did I do when well, they can't hit God? So the fight is not between you and them. The fight is between them and God because they're resisting the Holy Spirit. So Saul was turned, was stirred into a frenzy and used by the enemy to perse persecute the church. You know, in many of our experiences, and I don't know about you guys, we lost our mind in our sin before coming to Christ. <laughs> Before coming to Jesus, it was the darkest place I'd ever been. I got into the darkest sin that I'd ever been in, in my whole life. When the Holy Spirit started trying to draw me, it, it, was, it was like the Holy Spirit was trying to draw me, and I just went into a dark, real dark place. And I don't know if you can look at your walk like that and go, there was a time when the Holy Spirit was trying to draw me in, and it was right before, that's when everything just goes nuts, right? And it was a trip because... I, I do not think the devil can see the future, but I do think that the devil can see when God's hand is moving upon someone. I don't think that he can see the future. He is not sovereign like God. He can't be at every place at one time. He's not omniscient, none of that. But I do think that the enemy can see when the hand of God is moving in someone's life. And he's like, no, not her. She is too much of a player on my team. I can't let this one go. And he'll do everything to drive that person to cause maximum damage. Remember, Saul was there when Stephen gave his full message to the power of the Holy Spirit. He was cut to the heart, just like the rest of them. And he may not have even picked the stones up to throw, but he was part of the Sanhedrin who determined that Stephen would die. Exactly what I just said. Resistance to the Holy Spirit brings violence. And that is exactly what happened because afterwards he went on a complete rampage thinking he was doing the Lord's work until he meets Jesus on the Damascus road. <clears throat> Acts lays it out clearly in verse, um, chapter 9, verses 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went into the high priest. Acts 9-2, and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of this, of this way, that would be being a Christian, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound and onto Jerusalem. Saul was hell-bent on getting rid of the Christians. They were a direct affront to him. The word says, our very, we are a very fragrance to those who are hearing the gospel. In 2 Corinthians 2-15 says, it says, thanks be to God. And this is so I'm speaking, right? Thanks be to God who always leads us triumphant, triumphantly as captives in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. For we are to, to God the sweet aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To, to the one, we are an order of, odor of death and demise. To the other, a fragrance that brings life. So Saul was there he was consenting, he was listening, he was cut to the heart just like everyone else. And his resistance to that, what, what happened, was automatically deterred and he, became, he got just into a frenzy. 
and be bring havoc and going in and busting down doors. And as he went to Jerusalem to ask him for, let me have letters so I can go persecute these people. These people are against the temple. They're against the truth of God. They're this, this, that, and the other. And he's going from door to door, kicking in the door, snatching people out to take them to bound and captive. And we don't know if he killed people or not. Right? But just think about that. And it says, because this, we are a fragrance to, to some who are, is, is, is life. It's a sweet smelling aroma. But to those who deny Christ, it's an odor of death and demise. What fragrance are you putting off? Verses 8, uh, chapter 8, 4 through 8. So it says, therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord, he did the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And the lame was healed. And there was great joy in that city. So. Philip is one of the seven Holy Spirit filled men that was chosen to help with the widows, right? We saw that Stephen was one of the first martyrs. Philip is one of the first missionaries. This is the first time you see a missionary in the church. So because of this persecution, everyone scatters and they go to different places. Philip goes to Samaria. What's amazing about the fact that he went to Samaria is you have to remember that the Jews despised the Samaritans. Remember, we were introduced to a Samaritan from the woman of the well. Jesus made a special trip to go through Samaria in the book of John chapter four. He breaks all tradition and crosses all cultural barriers. He speaks to a woman, a Samaritan woman that was living in sin. And he reveals to her, even before the disciples, that he's the Messiah. Samaritans were considered half-breeds to the Jews. They were a mix of Jewish and pagan races, races that were utterly despised. There was such hate and animosity towards the Samaritans that when the Jews traveled in Judea, they went around Samaria to avoid entering into the land, even if it took them out of the way. But yet, compelled by the love of God and filled with the Holy Spirit, Philip goes directly to Samaria to bring the gospel. See, the gospel, it, it transcends those cultural barriers. The gospel is what breaks down all of those walls. Jesus came to reconcile men unto God. And our ministry is to reconcile men unto God. And it don't matter what they look like. Or where they come from. Jesus breaks down the cultural walls, the prejudice, society walls. And not only does he reconcile us with God, he reconciles us with one another. It's only in the church that you find a variety of people from all different backgrounds, all different social classes, all different belief systems. Well, I don't mean we believe one God, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Only in the church. Ephesians 2.14 says this, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, therefore putting to death the enmity. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far off and to those who are near. For through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. So Philip sent her to Samaria because the gospel transcends our hangups. And let me tell you what irritates me more than anything else, that Black Lives Matter stuff in the church. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely ridiculous. There's no way in the world from the pulpit should a pastor be worrying about what the skin color is. That's wrong. There's one race, and it's the human race under Jesus. That's it. And if we begin to bring the culture into the church, we destroy the church. So it says, Philip, he goes, he, he ministers to the Samaritans. But in verse 6, it says, and the multitudes, I love it. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. 
For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, many were paralyzed, and lame were healed, and there was a great joy in the city. Now, first, let's let, let's unpack that because the problem with a lot of people is, oh, he did miracles and he did wonders, and that's why they believed. That's not what it says. It doesn't say because he did the miracles and wonders they believed. It says, and the multitude with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip. They heeded the gospel first and foremost. It wasn't they believed because of what they saw. They believed because of what they heard. And John. Yeah. And John four, uh, in John four verses 29, still speaking about the Samaritan woman. Do you remember after Jesus reveals to her all, you know, well, yeah, you have five boyfriends and the one that you're living with is not your husband and da, da, da. And she says, how do you know these things? Right. Well, later on when she, when he's leaving and she's like, wants to go with him and she's like runs into town and she is so full of the Holy Spirit because the Messiah has just been revealed and she believed what she heard. She's so overwhelmed by the truth and God's amazing grace. She runs to tell the whole town to come and see a man who told me all the things. Could this be the Christ? This is the same place. So the Lord has already prepared the way through this one woman who Jesus had revealed, had him revealed himself to that one life that was touched, shared that God shared the gospel and the spirit had already prepared the hearts and minds of the people. So when Philip comes, bam, it was the, at the perfect time. God had already prepped the way. Isn't that how God does? He's already making a way. But if we stay complacent and stuck in our ruts and won't step out of our uncomfortable boxes or our comfortable boxes, excuse me, to do something uncomfortable, we will miss every opportunity the Lord has that he's already prepared a way for. Because we're so scared. I don't know about you guys. I feel weird sharing the gospel with people. I don't have a problem talking to people about God. Like, I, I truly don't. You guys know that. I don't have a problem talking to people about God. I have a problem walking up to strangers and going, how do you start the conversation? You know, some people are just evangelists. You know, do you know where you're going to go when you die? You know, to me, that's just corny as heck. And I'm like, how do I start a conversation like that? But I've always wanted to be like that to where I just want to share a gospel with everybody. Now, what I do do. And what the Lord allows for me because he knows it's my heart and I want an opportunity to share the gospel with people is what I do do is how are you doing today? Blah, blah, blah. And I'm talking. And I'm like, and you know, in my conversation anyway, it's like, oh, praise Jesus. That's awesome. And, da, da, da. and the Lord will just open up a door through that. You know, because they're looking at you like, you know, but I have a friend that, that wherever we go, she's quiet. She's reserved. She's you would never think this. Every place we go, every restaurant I've ever been with her, we're sitting there talking to the wait waitress and she goes, we're Christians. How can I pray for you right now? And just lays the gospel out just as sweet and quiet as possible. And I go, how did you just do that? And she's like, just tell them, you're Christians. I'm a Christian. I'd like to pray for you. How can I pray for your family? And you'll be amazed that people will go, can you pray for my sister? Can you pray for my mom? This is what I'm going through. Can you pray for that? You'll be blown away, but we never even look for those opportunities because we'd be stuck in our own box. I love what it says. It says they took heed. The multitude with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip. Ladies, do we take heed when we hear the truth of God's word? Now, taking heed, shamar means observe, preserve, regard, reserve, and keep. It is in the word of God and it says to be careful to pay attention to watch, be sober minded, treasure. Keep mindful of, meditate on. The word says that the Samaritans listened closely and they took heed. In Proverbs 2, 2, it says, I take heed and I treasure and keep the truth in my heart. It says, my son, if you accept my words and hide my commandments within you, if you incline your ear to wisdom and direct your heart to understanding, if you truly call out to insight and lift your voice for understanding, all of that is taking heed to. Do we take heed when we hear the truth of God's word? Are we meditating on it? Is it something that just resonates? Is it like, that's the truth, Lord. But do we go, okay, that was really good. And then it just goes right out. 
You know how many times I done left church and my kids, I go, oh my gosh, my one son, every single Sunday. What you learn from church today? Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. <laughs> every single Sunday, we see like, dude, did you hear anything else? <laughs> But do you take heed to it? Not only did they hear it, they took heed to it. Now, it says the unclean spirits came out and people were healed and, and the paralyzed was, was and the lame were healed and all this other stuff. And there was great joy in the city. But was it joy because they that Philip, cause Philip could cast out demons? Or was it joy that filled the city because they heard the gospel? They heeded the gospel. They obeyed the gospel. Then it was confirmed through the casting out of the demons and being healed. See, people skip that part. They want to see the miracles, the signs, and the wonders, but they don't want to take heed to the word of God. Are we looking for experiences with God or are we looking for God? Are we looking for a feeling and an emotion with Jesus? Or are we looking for, I want to just heed and obey you, Jesus. There's so many false teachers that put emphasis on searching after signs, miracles, and wonders. There are whole ministries that are dedicated to healing and deliverance. Jesus never intended for us to follow after signs, miracles, and wonders. Yes, he performed them. But they were not the cornerstone or the basis of his ministry. The gospel is the basis and the cornerstone of his ministry. He definitely did not just stop and set up a deliverance ministry. He did cast out demons. He did heal. He did do miracles. And you guys, I believe in every single gift of the Holy Spirit. I do believe they are operating today. I do believe that God still does miracles. I believe people will be healed. I believe demons can be cast out. I believe all that. And I've seen it. So I'm not saying that, I'm not dismissing it as it's not true. What I'm saying is you don't chase after those things. Because Jesus didn't just stop and set up a deliverance ministry. All of this stuff came at him as he walked out the gospel. So yes, as we walk in the power of God, as we're walking in the gospel, as we're walking in the truth of God's word in our life, yes, you're going to come against demons. Yes, you are going to come against people who you, you're going you're gonna to need to pray for people to be healed. Yes, you may see signs, miracles, and wonders if you are heeding the word of God and walking in the word of God. You are walking in the spiritual, you're going to see the spiritual. But let me tell you something that Jesus said in Luke 10. And this was after Jesus had sent 70 disciples out to spread the gospel. So the disciples went out, Jesus sent them out. This is all fresh. They're sharing the gospel. The 70 return in Luke 10, it says the 70 return with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over, uh, over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, look what he says. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this. That the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Amen. That's what Jesus says. He said, dude, I see Satan fall out the sky. Big deal. <laughs> he says, and yes, you do have the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome these things. And now the whole thing about the surface, if people take that super literal, I don't know. I'm going to pick up a snake and test God. But. What he's saying is, my spirit is with you. It will protect you. It will keep you as you are heeding and walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes, you are going to come against the spiritual. We're in a spiritual realm. But don't chase after those things. And that stuff is not important. What is important is your name is written in the book of life, eternal life. That's it. But man is so deceptive and we're so deceptive. Our hearts above all else are what? Wicked. Wicked. Wicked and corrupt that will even use God to try to have power. Jesus said, yes, 
you, we are in a spiritual war. We are going to come face to face with even when we boldly proclaim the gospel and move in the Lord's will. But it's not for us to rejoice or get puffed up in it. We are not to go chasing after miracle signs and wonders. We're not to build whole ministries on deliverance and healings. We are to rejoice that our names are written in heaven and we have eternal life. That was why the city was filled with joy. Verse 9. But there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced, source, practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all should give heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for so long. We see here the perfect counterfeit. Simon, also known as Simon Magus, practiced witchcraft. He was most likely a warlock because he practiced the magic arts and the things that he did astonished. As, astonished, the word is ex, extatame, the people, and got their attention. Now listen, we're going to go back to that, like what um, extatame means in just a moment. He got their attention so much that they believed he had a great power of God. But we know that not every spiritual power is of God. Whatever power he had was satanic. But the truth was that he claimed himself to be something great, like most of those TV preachers that you see. He proclaimed himself to be great. Not other people, not everyone else. He proclaimed himself to be great. So ecstatic we see that this one Greek word, ecstatome, is in three verses. It's in verse 9, verse 11, and verse 13. And it means the astonished, amazed. It's translated as astonished or bewitched. In verse 13, it's translated amazed. It means to throw someone's mind out of position into wonderment and amazement. So the effect that Simon had on the minds of the people of Samaria through his magic arts is the same effect that Philip's miracles had on him. Isn't that a trip? So Simon is watching. Now, mind you, he knows he's a counterfeit. But yet, the, 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 now let me, let, me, let me clear some stuff up. The devil will give you power. There are people, there are hoax and there are, there, there are uh, charlatans, but there's also real people with spirits of div divination. Is that what it's called? Divination? Where they're able to see things. Um, I just recently met a sister that, I mean, was really, really into this kind of stuff and, and had a lot of power, a lot of power, and, and not lying about it. And uh, because the enemy, he does have the ability to give you power because when he took, when Jesus was up on a mountain, he said the whole world, the whole world I'll give to you. All these riches, all this, everything you want if you just bow down and worship me. Jesus never once disputed him and said, no, you can't do that. You don't have the power to do that. He just said, it is written. So the devil does have the ability to give us, to give you power. And unfortunately, um, but we know that that power is, you know, is demonic. But Simon being a warlock and astonishing the people or amazing the people with these, these things that the enemy had given him power to do. And they saw it. Except for he said it came from God. But when he saw the power of God. So let's read it. It says, blah, blah, blah. There was a certain man called Simon Tim. Oh, verse 12. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. So... Simon is in this city. He's a sorcerer. He's probably been the big shot the whole time in Samaria. Everybody's coming to him. One of the things that the little sister told me about that particular um, uh, lifestyle is that people are addicted to you because you have an answer for them. Because, you know, for psychics and readers and all this other kind of stuff, you know, people are become addicted to that. What happens if I broke up with my boyfriend? What happens with my job? What happens to this, this, and the other? And they begin to call this person and depend upon this person. So they're the big shot. You know, I mean, you can think that that would totally puff your head up, right? Um, and so Simon's probably the big shot and the sorcerer and all this other stuff. And people are just so amazed and they're saying he's just such this great man of God. But then here comes the true power of God. And Philip comes in and he brings the word of God. But you notice here with Simon, what he was amazed by was the power. 
It says in when we when we read earlier, it says that the people heeded the word of God and then they saw the miracles and all that other stuff. But it was them heeding the word of God and understanding and accepting and believing the word of God first and foremost. What we see here is it says he believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and he was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. But what did he believe? What did he believe? So we're going to go on because what we'll find out is that what did he believe? Did he believe Jesus Christ? Or did he just believe what he saw, the power? And, you know, Daryl is in this whole thing that I don't know about you guys, but the armor has been so good for me. Because your soul can so mimic the spirit. And, 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 you know, we will read this and say he got saved. Because he believed. It's all kinds of people in the church that believe. But what do they believe? Who do they believe in? How many people in the church say, I believe Jesus? And we think, oh, they're saved. But then when I go to have a deeper conversation with a sister you talking about the wrong Jesus. That's not the Jesus of the Bible. What are you talking about? Oh, well, Jesus is a good guy. He was a prophet. He did good things. You will never know. Just because people say they believe something, you will never know what they believe unless you truly ask them. Okay, but what do you believe about Christ? Do you believe he's God? Do you believe he's part of the Trinity? That right there catches a whole lot of people up. Oh, no. He said, it's not three, but yet one. It's not one, but yet three. It's, how's that? What's the Trinity? Right? So the belief is here. But what does he believe? And it reveals. And you know what's amazing is that the Lord will always reveal what you truly believe. What you believe about your God, too. And I'm going to say that as Christians. We only walk out what we believe. We only walk out what we believe. When we was in the book of James, that was one of the biggest things that stood out for me was James was your faith on display. What do you believe about your God? How is it displayed? Right? So now when apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. Saying, give me this power also that anyone whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Then Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me that none of these things which you have spoken may come upon me. So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. <laughs> the main word for belief is paste, 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 I can't say it, pasteo. And it can mean a mere acknowledgement of some fact or event, an intellectual faith. Ladies, just because someone said they believe, they can believe Jesus right here, but it never hit here. They can believe intellectually, but it's never here. Both Simon and the people of Samaria believed Philip concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. So the big problem is how come these people did not receive the Holy Spirit at the point of salvation? They got saved. So is there like some special revelation that has to happen for us to get the Spirit? There's an, here's another false teaching. You need a second filling of the Holy Spirit. A second coming of the Holy Spirit. That's all false. <clears throat> some people say, some scholars say, well, maybe they were not saved. Maybe they really were not saved. They just believed here and they didn't really get saved. Others will say that they were saved, but received a second blessing of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> now, this false doctrine creates two classes of Christians, the regulars and the super saints. <laughs> Remember, we're in the book of Acts, which was a transitional period when God was doing a lot of unique things in 
the church. People think that they can react the book of Acts. You know, everybody's always saying that. We need to get back to the book of Acts. It was a unique time that the Lord built a unique church, and it was the beginning of his church, and he was establishing a new thing. Now, do I know that the Holy Spirit can still move like that? Yes, but we're never going back to the book of Acts, right? And at that point, it was a transitional period when God was doing a lot of unique things to establish the foundation of the church. With that being said, me and Daryl agree that we don't know <laughs> why they weren't filled with the Holy Spirit at the point of salvation. No one knows. It doesn't tell you that. And if someone tries to make it up, they're lying. If the scripture don't say it, the scripture don't say it. It does say that they received the word of God, just like the disciples had believed and received the word of God before the Pentecost. But whatever happened, it was noticeable, and God chose to use the apostles' prayer and laying on of the hands to empower them with the Holy Spirit. And I'm not going to go any further than that. I will explain this. I got saved. This is my own personal experience. I get saved. I do believe that at the point of my salvation, so I think I got saved when I kneeled down on the side of bed and said, check it out. If it's a God, I don't believe you. I think that's when I got saved. Maybe in my heart, maybe I got started there. I don't know. <laughs> when I got to prison and, and they told me to surrender and I just did, I didn't even know what the gospel was, but I just knew God was speaking directly to me. I got saved. When they cast out the demons out of me at the point of my salvation and I'm rolling down around on the ground and foaming at the mouth and speaking in other languages and demons are coming out of me, I believe I was delivered. But I could not read the Bible and I was not filled. And I don't mean, I think the Holy Spirit was dwelling in me, but I was not empowered by the Holy Spirit for whatever ministry God had for me. It wasn't until Keisha Hollins laid hands on me to be able to read the Bible, because I could not read the Bible, I would pick the Bible up and go like this. <laughs> Immediately. I could not read the Bible. It was literally like a cloud over my eyes where I could not understand it at all. And when this girl prayed for me and she laid hands on me and the anointing of the Holy Spirit was just like, whoosh. And I was able to pick up the word of God and open it up and it just unfolded. It was just like, oh, <gasps> And from there, I was empowered for ministry. So I don't think that there's a second baptism of the Holy Spirit, but I do think the laying on his hands because you see Paul and you see all of them as they send out people, missionaries and all, they lay hands on them for the empowering and the refilling and the re anointing of the Holy Spirit to do what God has called them to do. That's what I believe happened here. But does it say it? No. So that's Kim's opinion. So... So, and when Simon saw that the laying on the apostles' hands and the Holy Spirit, oh, we're going to be finished in a minute, he offered them money. Now, that is funny to me. He, he, he's like, look, look give, give me some of what you got. <laughs> I want some of that power. <laughs> I want some of that power. I don't know what happened to my notes. Hold on. Oh, listen. Basically, what Peter told him is you and your money can go to hell. <laughs> That's what he told him. He said, you and your money perish. Simon always wanted to be something great and thought that he could learn to use God for his own glory. Remember, he is a proclaimed, I am a man of God. This is the power of God. I am a great man. Then here comes his disciples and they really are, he really does see the power. Okay, that's going to make me more powerful. So anything in life, we can buy. You know, name your price. Everything's, everything's for sale. So why would he not think, hey, give me some money. I'll give you some money. You can give me what you got so I can be greater than what I already am. So when he saw the power of the Holy Spirit fall upon the people, he wanted that for himself so that he could be great again. Buying a position in the church is called simony. And a lot of people pay their way into positions in the church. This was very, very, very... Um, prevalent in the Catholic, in the Roman Catholic Church. They paid their way into positions. And I think they also paid for people to come out of purgatory too, right? 
you, they would pray them out, but you would have to pay a certain amount to even pray them out of purgatory, right? Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. I think I watched that with Martin Luther. It was that, that movie with Luther. Um, but it was called Simony. And a lot of people would pay their way into positions in the church. Anyways, Peter, he had the gift of discernment. You know, Peter, Peter was powerful. I love that Peter was a coward at first, and God just turned him to be fearless and bolus and just, he used all his craziness. Peter was me. He was just crazy. He was, I don't know what. But the Lord was just like, let's contain that. We're going to use that for me. So uh, Peter had to get the discernment, and he knew that, that Simon wasn't saved. So he told him. Now, listen to what he tells him, though. This is how you know he wasn't saved. He told him, repent and pray to God for forgiveness and true salvation. So, you know, this is a really good example of how our soul can so mimic the spirit and how a lot of times we, it's so many people in church who say, I believe, but they only believe here. It has never translated to here. And that's what we were talking about in the armor of God, the wheat and the tares grow up together. Right. Simon had no real interest in coming to the Lord in spirit and truth. He just did. He did not want a consequence. So he asked Peter to pray for him so that nothing bad would happen to him. It's kind of like when Jeroboam, remember in, in Kings, as we're going through Kings, and he says, and he tells Jeroboam when he withers his hand as he reaches out to the altar, and he goes, pray to your God for me. Well, it shows right then and there. That's not your God. Right? He says, pray to your God for me. So this thing, and then he, and he prays for him and he's healed. What's well, the same thing here? Simon doesn't say, oh, I repent. I, I'm so sorry. I didn't know. Or Lord, forgive me. He doesn't have any kind of repentance whatsoever. He says, pray to your God. So he'll forgive me that these things don't happen to me. Like Simon, a lot of people want to control God and have his power under their authority. And they teach that the power can be yours to command God if you follow them. They like to hang around the church and look like good, powerful Christians, but their real purpose is to gain their own personal following. And many do have huge congregations. Huge congregations that say, you have the power. I've been told that so many. You, well, you have authority over this, and you have authority over that. Yes, I have spiritual authority. I, I recognize that God has given us spiritual authority. The Holy Spirit lives in us. As I said, we come along, we see the things that are spiritual. But I have no power in myself. That power is Christ, mm -hmm. right? And if I seek after wanting more power, it's kind of like I think Daryl had you guys watch that thing on Wednesday where the dude was saying, well, the demon told me. Remember the little de the devil told him something and God told him something and he, and he dismissed what God was telling him, but the, he listened to what the devil said because he had the authority to cast that devil out. Do you guys remember? I don't know if Daryl showed you guys. It was about counterfeit stuff, but it was, I know, but in second Peter, it talks about false teachers. It's always about them getting money, power, and sex. The greater damage to the church is from the inside rather than from the outside. The greater damage done to the church is to the Christians from other people who say that they're Christians. The greatest damage in the church is for leaders and shepherds who are called to be God's shepherds are really wolves there to devour the sheep. The greater damage to the church is people who want people to follow man and not God. Unfortunately, in my culture, a lot of times in the churches, it's more about the pastor than it is Jesus. You know, I, I've, I'm under this pastor, such and such and such bishop, cardinal, such and, you know, evangelist, apostle. <laughs> you know, they got 90,000 titles because that's man wanting to be powerful. Why do you not need 90,000 titles in the church? What does that make you? A great person? Right? And so more damage is done to the church by the people in the church, but mostly by people who say that they are shepherding for God. Jesus said, be aware of false teachers in sheep's clothing who will come to him in the last day talking about all they did in his name. And what is he going to say? 
It's going to be so many people say, Lord, I cast out demons in your name. I did miracles in your name. I did this. I did this in your name. And he's going to say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never even knew you. That's deep right there. And I think it's so many more people that, that that's going to happen to than we even believe. I think the church is extremely small. The real church is really small. So in ending, verse 25. So when they had testified and preached, then, oh, then Simon answered, said, pray to the Lord for me that none of these things which you have spoken may come upon me. So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, this is the apostles, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. I like how God puts little jewels of wisdom in between, like kind of like bookends. It starts with the gospel, it ends with the gospel. And everything that's in between it is trying to distract from the gospel. Everything designed in our life is to make us ineffective as Christians. It is to distract us from the gospel of Jesus Christ, from the truth of God's word. All our situations and circumstances that we face, and we're like, oh my gosh, this is any other. It all is a distraction, ladies. It starts with the gospel of Jesus Christ and the truth of God's word and heeding the word of God. And it ends with the gospel of Jesus Christ and heeding the word of God. Everything else is a distraction in between that. If we chase after the devil, guess what? We're going to find him. Are we serving God because we want an experience? Are we serving God behind our feelings? Do we really examine? You know, Paul says, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. So many of us are like, oh, I'm good. Now, you know, I don't believe you can lose your salvation. So I don't think, I mean, if you saved, you're saved. That's it. But do you just want to be saved? Are you complacent and comfortable where you are? Ask yourself, why would you be complacent and comfortable where you are? Our God is always moving. He's always doing something. He's always working. He's always wanting us to step into a new opportunity, a new place, a new season, a new direction for him, for his glory. Some of us are battle weary. I am battle weary, tired. It seems like I'm pushing against a rock that is never gonna move uphill. And you can do that and you can get battle weary and you just go, I, I'm, I'm just going to sit right here. I'm just, I'm going to do the bare minimum. But it starts with the gospel of Jesus Christ and he never did the bare minimum. He gave every part of himself for us. Everything. He laid it out on the cross for us. And it should compel us to do everything for him. So in the book of Acts, what I pray that we're learning, or what I pray that I'm learning, even getting out of it, is that I want all of Jesus. I don't want to be comfortable with this much. I don't want to do the bare minimum. I don't want to just show up to church and go through the motions. I want everything God got. Do you? Amen. Lord, we thank you, Father. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you, God, that, Lord, it starts with you and ends with you. You are the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And everything in between, you've already written our days, Lord. You've already written the days. Help us to just yield to your leading, to your truth, to heed your word. To be excited over everything that you bring into our life because it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to glorify you, to share Jesus with someone, to see the truth of the hope of the calling that is within us to go forth. 
Lord, and for us that are battle weary, God, that strengthen us up. You don't ask us to fight, you tell us to stand. So, Lord, just strengthen our feet that we can stand. Be our core, be our foundation that we can stand. When we're limp, when we're weak, when we're wounded. Help us, Lord. We need you. Empower your church, your body, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, heeding the word of God, excited over the gospel, and true to your word. In Jesus' name, amen.